9 clinging, yupadana. 10 hapakaya yupadanam dependent on craving arises clinging. This is the mental state that clings to, or grasps, the object even as a piece of raw meat that sticks to a saucepan. Because of this clinging, which is described as craving in a high degree, man becomes a slave to passion, and falls into the net he himself has made of his passion for pleasure. Like the caterpillar that spins itself a tangle in which it lives. Yupadana, clinging or attachment, is fourfold. I, attachment to sensuous pleasures or sense desires, kama yupadana. Two, attachment to wrong and evil views, ditha yupadana. Three, attachment to mere external observances, rites, and rituals, silabeta yupadana. And, four, attachment to self or a lasting soul entity, atavata yupadana. Kama here means both the craving and the craved object, kilsa kama and vatha kama, and when that craving for such desired objects becomes intensified, it is known as kama yupadana or clinging. Man entertains thoughts of craving, and in proportion as he fails to ignore them, they grow till they get intensified to the degree of tenacious clinging. All the various wrong views, ditha, that were in existence during the time of the Buddha can be included in annihilationism, Akitaditha, and eternalism, Sasitaditha. To some, especially to the intellectuals, at times the giving up of a view that they have cherished is more difficult than giving up objects of sense. Of all wrong views, the clinging to a belief in a soul or self or an abiding ego entity, Atavata Yupadana, is the strongest, foremost, and most pernicious. It is not without good reason that the Buddha rejected the notion of a self or soul, Atta. In this conflux of mind and body which undergoes change without remaining the same for two consecutive moments, the Buddha could not see a lasting, indestructible soul. In other words, he could locate no abiding soul in this ever-changing being. The Master, therefore, emphatically denied an Atta either in the five aggregates, material form, feeling, perception, volitional formations, consciousness, or elsewhere. All this, he said, is void of an atta or anything of the nature of an atta, sunam ida matina va atani yena va. 29. If this wrong notion is got rid of, all the existing wrong and pernicious views automatically cease. The master's clear injunction to Mogaraja is. Sunato lokam avekhasu Mogaraja sata sato. Atanuditha muhakatavam makutaro si ya. O Mogaraja, ever mindful. See the world as void. Having eradicated the view of a self, one may overcome death. SN 1119. The doctrine of anatta, anatma, is exclusively Buddhistic and is distinguishable from every other religion and philosophy. It is the heart and core of the Buddha's teaching. It was the recognition that this self, atta, is an illusion, a mirage that made the Buddha's doctrine so singular and so revolutionary. All the existing religions do believe in a soul or self and they claim it to be all-powerful, all-pervading, indestructible, and permanent. To the believers in a soul, soul is a permanent entity that has taken root in all beings. Some say that this atma spreads throughout the length and breadth of the body like oil in a sesame seed, others say that it surrounds the body in the form of an imperceptible light which light one perceives when cleansed of all impurities. Still others profess that it is within us, like a gem twinkling in a casket. Still others say it is consciousness, or perception, or sensation, or volition and some conclude that this atma consists of both mind and body nama and rupa. Buddhism advocates no such unchanging entity or soul or atma. In conventional usage we speak of a being, I, etc., but in the highest sense there exists no being. There is no I-personality. Each one of us is the manifestation of his or her kamic force, and a composition of nothing but an ever-changing conflux of mind and body. This mind and body separated from each other lose something of their potency and cannot function alone indefinitely. But as a boat and a boatman together cross the stream, and as a lame man mounted on the shoulders of a blind man reach their destination, so mind and body when wedded together function best. Unceasingly does the mind and its factors change, and just as unceasingly, though at a slower rate, 
the body alters from moment to moment. The conflux of mind and body goes on as incessantly as the waves of the sea, or as the Buddhists say Nadi Soto Vaya, like a flowing stream. Thus the being or mind and body, samsara, or the procession of events, is utterly free from the notion of a jivatma or paramatma, microcosmic soul, or macrocosmic soul. X becoming, bhava. Yupadana pakaya bhavu, dependent on clinging arises becoming. Becoming is twofold, and should be understood as two processes, kama process, kama bhava, and kama resultant process, yupapati bhava. Kama bhava is the accumulated good and evil actions, the comically active side of life. Yupapati bhava is the comically passive and morally neutral side of life. And signifies the kama resultant rebirth process in the next life. The next life may be in any sphere or plane that of sensuous existence, kama bhava, that of form, rupa bhava, or that of formless existence, arupa bhava. In the first clause, Avihyapakaya Sankhara, Sankhara is explained as good and evil actions, Kama. If that is so, is it not repetitive to say that Kama Bhava, mentioned here, also means good and evil actions? The Patika Samupada, we must know, is concerned not only with the present life but with all the three lives past, present, and future. Kama. Or the good and evil actions mentioned in the first clause, belong to the past and on those past actions the present life depends. The kama that is referred to here in this clause, Yupadana bhavu, belongs to the present life and that in turn causes future life. Yupadana bhavu, meaning clinging, Yupadana, is the condition of the kama process, or actions, and of the kama resultant rebirth process. 11 Birth, Jatai Bhavapakaya Jatai dependent on becoming arises birth. Here birth means not the actual childbirth, but the appearance of the five aggregates, material form, feeling, perception, formations, and consciousness, in the mother's womb. This process is conditioned by Kamabhava. The present birth is brought about by the craving and clinging Kama volitions, Tenha Yupadana, of the past birth, and the craving and clinging acts of will of the present birth bring about future rebirth. According to the teaching of the Buddha, it is this kama volition that divides beings into high and low. Beings are heirs of their deeds, bearers of their deeds, and their deeds are the womb out of which they spring, 30. And through their deeds alone they must change for the better, remake themselves, and win liberation from ill. We are reaping what we have sown in the past, some of our reapings, we know, we have even sown in this life. In the same way, our actions here mold the hereafter. And thus we begin to understand our position in this mysterious universe. If we, through our ignorance, craving, and clinging in the long night of samsaric wandering, have not shaped ourselves as we are, how could there be such difference and dissimilarity between living beings as we see in the world today? Can we conceive of a mind, a single mind, vast and confused enough to plan out such a motley sentient world as surrounds us? Thus Kama is the corollary of rebirth, and rebirth, on the one hand, is the corollary of Kama. Here it may be asked, if Kama is the cause of rebirth and if Buddhism emphatically denies a soul or a transcendental ego, how does this Kamic process bring about rebirth? Well, no force is ever lost, and there is no reason to think that the force manifest in each being as mind and body is ever lost. It ever undergoes transformations. It is changing now, every moment of our lives. Nor is it lost at death. The vitalizing mind flux is merely reset. It resets in conditions harmonizing with itself, even as broadcast sounds reset in a receiver tuned to the particular wavelength. It is the resetting of this vital flux, in fresh conditions, that is called rebirth. Each reborn being starts with a unique set of latent possibilities, the accumulated experiences of the past. That is why character differs, why each endows himself with what theists call gifts, and infinite possibilities. 31. There is nothing that passes or transmigrates from one life to another. Is it not possible to light one lamp from another and in this process does any flame pass from one to the other? 
Do you not see the continuity of the flame? It is neither the same flame nor a totally different one. The kamic process, kamabhava, therefore, is the force in virtue of which reaction follows actions, it is the energy that, out of a present life, conditions a future life in unending sequence. Desire gives rise to deed, deed gives rise to result, result exhibits itself as new corporeality endowed with new desire. Deed is as inevitably followed by result as the body by its shadow. This is merely the universal natural law of conservation of energy extended to the moral domain. As in the universe no energy can ever be lost, so also in the individual nothing can be lost of the resilient force accumulated by desire. This resilient energy is always transmuted into fresh life and we live eternally through our lust to live. The medium, however, that makes all existence possible is Kama. 32. 12. Aging and Death, Jaramarana. Jatapakaya Jaramaranam, dependent on birth arise aging and death, and with them naturally come sorrow, lamentation, pain, grief, and despair. Birth is inevitably followed by aging and death, in the absence of birth there will be no aging and death. Thus this whole mass of suffering arises dependent on the twelve-fold dependent origination. Aging and death are followed by birth, and birth, on the other hand, is followed by aging and death. The pair thus accompany each other in bewildering succession. Nothing mundane is still, it is all in flux. People build up wishful hopes and plans for the morrow, but one day, sudden perhaps and unexpected, there comes the inevitable hour when death puts an end to this brief span of life. And brings our hopes to naught. So long as man is attached to existence through his ignorance, craving, and clinging. For him death is not the final end. He will continue his career of whirling along with the will of existence, and will be twisted and torn between the spokes of agony. Thus, looking around us in the world at the different types of men and women, and at the differences in their varying fortunes, we know that these cannot be due to mere chance. An external power or agency that punishes the ill deeds and rewards the good deeds of beings has no place in Buddhist thought. Buddhists do not resort to any especially graced person or pray to any imperceptible individual to grant them deliverance. Not even the Supreme Buddha could redeem them from samsara's bond. In ourselves lies the power to mold our lives. Buddhists are Kamevadins, believers in the efficacy of actions, good and evil. According to the teachings of the Buddha, the direct cause of the distinctions and inequalities of birth in this life is the good and evil actions of each individual in past lives. In other words, each person is reaping what he has sowed in the past. In the same way, his actions here mold his hereafter. In all actions, good and evil, mind is the most important factor. All mental states have mind as their forerunner, mind dominates, everything is mind made. If one speaks or acts with a polluted mind, pain follows him in consequence as the cartwheel follows the foot of the beast of burden. In like manner, in consequence of mentations made, words spoken, and deeds done with a pure and placid mind, happiness follows him even like the inseparable shadow. 33. Man is always changing either for good or for evil. This changing is unavoidable and depends entirely on our own actions and environment. The world seems to be imperfect and ill-balanced. We are too often confronted with many a difficulty and shortcoming. People differ from one another in many ways and aspects. Among us human beings, let alone the animal kingdom, we see some born as miserable wretches, sunk in deep distress and supremely unhappy. Others born into a state of abundance and happiness enjoying a life of luxury and knowing nothing of the world's woe. Again, a chosen few are gifted with keen intellect and great mental capacity while many are wrapped in ignorance. How is it that some of us are blessed with health, beauty, sincere friends, and amiable relatives while others are despicable weaklings, destitute and lonely? How is it that some are born to enjoy long life while others pass away in the full bloom of youth? Why are some blessed with affluence, fame, and recognition? Why are some chosen few given in full measure all the things which human beings deserve while others are utterly neglected? These are intricate problems that demand a solution. 
if we but pause for a moment and impartially investigate and intelligently inquire into things, we will find that these wide differences are not the work of an external agency or a superhuman being. We will find that we ourselves are responsible for our deeds whether good or ill and that we ourselves are the makers of our own kama. Says the Buddha. According to the seed that is sown, so is the fruit ye reap therefrom. The doer of good, will gather, good. The doer of evil, evil, reaps. Sown is the seed and planted well. Thou shalt enjoy the fruit thereof. 34. It is impossible to conceive of an external agency or some all-powerful being who distributes his gifts to different persons in diverse measures. And who at times showers all his gifts on the same individual. Is it not more rational to say that? Who toiled a slave may come anew a prince. For gentle worthiness and merit one. Who ruled a king may wander earth in rags. For things done and undone. Light of Asia. Buddhists do not blame the Buddha or a superhuman being or a deva or an especially graced person for the ills of humanity or praise them for the happiness people experience. It is knowledge of Kama and Kama Vipaka, the law of cause and effect, or moral causation, that urges a true Buddhist to refrain from evil and do good. He who understands cause and effect knows well that it is his own actions and nothing else that make his life miserable or otherwise. He knows that the direct cause of the distinctions and inequalities of birth in this life is the good and evil actions of each individual in past lives and in this life. Man today is the result of millions of repetitions of thought and action. He is not ready-made, he becomes, and is still becoming. His character is predetermined by his own choice. The thought, the act which he chooses, that by habit he becomes. It should, however, be remembered that according to Buddhism not everything that occurs is due to past actions. During the time of the Buddha, Sectarians like Nigantha Nataputta, Makhali Gozala, and others, held the view that whatever the individual experiences, be it pleasant or unpleasant or neither, all come from former actions or past kama. 35 The Buddha, however, rejected this theory of an exclusive determination by the past, Pabhikata Hitu, as unreasonable. Many things are the result of our own deeds done in this present life, and of external causes. Hence it is not true to say that all things that occur are due to past kama or actions. Is it not absurd for a student who fails in his examination due to sheer laxity on his part, to attribute the failure to his past kama? Is it not equally ridiculous for a person to rush about carelessly, bang himself against a stone or some similar thing, and ascribe the mishap to his past kama? One can multiply such instances to show that not everything is due to actions performed in the past. But when the causes and conditions of things are destroyed, automatically the effects also cease to be. Sorrow will disappear if the varied rootlets of sorrow's cause are eliminated. A man, for instance, who burns to ashes a mango seed, puts an end to its germinating power and that seed will never produce a mango plant. It is the same with all compounded things, sankhara, animate or inanimate. As kama is our own manufacture we have the power to break this endless chain, this will of existence, bhavakaka. Referring to those enlightened ones who have conquered themselves through the uprooting of the defilements, the Buddha says in the Ratana Sutta. Their past, kama, is spent, their new, kama, no more arises, their mind to future becoming is unattached. The germ, of rebirth consciousness, has died, they have no more desire for reliving. Those wise ones fade out, of existence, like the flame of this lamp. 36. It is said that as the Buddha spoke these words he saw the flame of a lamp go out. The Patika Samuppada, with its twelve links starting with ignorance and ending in aging and death, shows how man, being fettered, wanders in samsara birth after birth. But by getting rid of these twelve factors man can liberate himself from suffering and rebirth. The Buddha has taught us the way to put an end to this repeated wandering. It is by endeavoring to halt this wheel of existence that we may find the way out of this tangle. The Buddha word which speaks of the cessation of suffering is stated thus. Through the entire cessation of ignorance cease volitional formations. 
Through the cessation of volitional formations, consciousness ceases. Through the cessation of consciousness, mentality materiality ceases. Through the cessation of mentality materiality, the sixfold base ceases. Through the cessation of the sixfold base, contact ceases. Through the cessation of contact, feeling ceases. Through the cessation of feeling, craving ceases. Through the cessation of craving, clinging ceases. Through the cessation of clinging, becoming ceases. Through the cessation of becoming, birth ceases. Through the cessation of birth, cease aging, and death, sorrow, lamentation, pain, grief, and despair. Thus does this whole mass of suffering cease. 37. Though in Buddhism time is considered as a mere concept, panati. In the language of the apparent truth, Samyuti Saka, we speak of three periods of time, namely, the past. The present and the future and the Patika Samuppada formula can be taken as representing them. The two factors ignorance and volitional formations, Avihya and Sankhara, belong to the past. The next eight, beginning with consciousness, Vinana, belong to the present, and the last pair, birth and aging and death, belong to the future. In this will of existence there are then three connecting links, Sandhi. Between volitional formations, Sankhara, the last factor of the past, and consciousness, Vinana. The first factor of the present, there is one link consisting of past cause and present fruit, Hichufala. Consciousness, mentality materiality, the sixfold base, contact and feeling are effects in the present life caused by ignorance and volitional formations of the past. Because of these five factors there come into being three other factors, namely, craving, clinging, and becoming, which will cause birth in the future. Therefore, between feeling and craving there is another link consisting of present fruit and present cause, Falahichu. Because of craving, clinging, and becoming of the present, there come into being birth, aging, and death in the future. Therefore, between becoming and birth there is another link. These three links consist of four sections. I. Ignorance volitional formations. 2. Consciousness, mentality materiality, the sixfold base, contact, feeling. 3. Craving, clinging, becoming. 4. Birth and aging and death. There were five causes in the past. And now there is a fivefold fruit. There are five causes now as well. And in the future fivefold fruit. 38. The text mentions ignorance and volitional formations as past causes. But one who is ignorant, hankers, and hankering, clings. And with his clinging as condition there is becoming, therefore craving, clinging, and becoming are included as well. Hence it is said, in the previous Kama process becoming, there is delusion, which is ignorance, there is accumulation, which is formations, there is attachment which is craving, there is embracing, which is clinging, there is volition, which is becoming. Thus these five things in the previous Kama process becoming are conditions for rebirth linking here, in the present becoming, dot. 39. Now the fivefold fruit in the present life as given in the text is represented by five factors, consciousness, mentality materiality, the sixfold base, contact, feeling. There are five causes we now produce, of which the text gives only craving, clinging, and becoming. But when becoming is included, the formations that precede it or that are associated with it are included too. And by including craving and clinging, the ignorance associated with them, diluted by which a man performs kama, is included too. So they are five. The fivefold fruit we reap in the future. This is represented by consciousness, mentality materiality, the sixfold base, contact, feeling. The text gives also birth and aging and death as the future fivefold fruit. Birth really is represented by these five beginning with consciousness and ending in feeling. Aging and death is the aging and death of these five. On close analysis, 
it becomes clear that in this dependent origination, patikasamupada, in this repeated process of rebirth, in this cycle of existence, there is nothing permanent, no enduring soul entity that passes from one birth to the next. All dhammas are causally dependent, they are conditioned, sabdhamma patikasamupana, and this process of events is utterly free from the notion of a permanent soul or self. The Buddha declares, to believe the doer of the deed will be the same as the one who experiences its results, in the next life, this is the one extreme. To believe that the doer of the deed and the one who experiences its results are two different persons. This is the other extreme. Both these extremes the Tathagata, the perfect one, has avoided and taught the truth that lies in the middle of both. Namely, through ignorance conditioned are the Kama formations and so on, see formula. Thus arises this whole mass of suffering. Hence the ancients said. There is no doer of a deed. Or one who reaps the deed's result. Phenomena alone flow on. No other view than this is right. For here there is no Brahma God. Creator of the round of births. Phenomena alone flow on. Cause and component their condition. 40. In concluding this essay on dependent origination, a confusion that may arise in the reader's mind should be forestalled. If according to dependent origination things are determined by conditions, one may be inclined to think that the Buddha encouraged fatalism or determinism. And that human freedom and free will are put aside. But what is fatalism? According to the Dictionary of Philosophy, fatalism is determinism, especially in its theological form which asserts that all human activities are predetermined by God. Determinism, according to the Oxford English Dictionary, is the philosophical doctrine that human action is not free but necessarily determined by motives, which are regarded as external forces acting upon the will. The doctrine of Kama refutes that. A clear understanding of Buddhism shows that the Buddha never subscribed to the theory that all things are unalterably fixed. That all things happen by inevitable necessity that is strict determinism, Nyayadavada, nor did he uphold the theory of complete indeterminism, Adhikasamapana. Everywhere we see certain laws and conditions functioning, and one of these is Sitana or volition, which is Kama. There is no lawgiver, no external agency to interfere with the mental and material happenings. Through causes and conditions things come to be. Thus is this endless play of action and reaction kept in perpetual motion by Kama, concealed by ignorance, and propelled by craving. In no way does this affect the freedom of the will and the responsibility of man for his acts, his Kama. Lastly a word about free will, will is not something static. It is not a positive entity, or a self-existent thing. Will is quite momentary like any other mental state. There is, therefore, no will as a thing to be either free or not free. The truth is that will is conditioned and a passing phenomenon. To the genuine Buddhist the primary concern of life is not mere speculation, or vain voyages into the imaginary regions of high fantasy, but the gaining of true happiness and freedom from all suffering. Patikasamupada, which speaks of suffering, dukkha, and the cessation of suffering, is the central concept of Buddhism, and represents the finest flower of Indian thought.